This is Wells Tech, a show that explores the intersection of technology and ministry. Wells Tech is a part of the Streams Media Network, sponsored by Wells, the Wisconsin Evangelical Lutheran Synod. Your show hosts are Martin Spriggs and Sally Draper. Join the conversation at wellstech.wells.net. Hello again, everybody. This is Martin Spriggs with Wells Tech. This is episode 467 for October 18th, 2016. A little show about technology and ministry. We visit you each week, and we're glad that you tuned in as we try and find those intersections uh, of technology and ministry. Joining me, as usual, Sally Draper. Hey, Sally. Hey, Martin. Happy to be joining you as usual, but actually an unusual time for us this morning. We normally uh, record these shows around one o'clock on Tuesday afternoons, and today we're up at 10 a.m. So I don't know, maybe that'll make us a little more il- alert for the podcast today. We'll well, we see. can use any help we can get, I'm thinking. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, there's a couple other, there's at least one other new component here. I am actually not using the computer I normally use. I didn't tell you this ahead of time, so as not to worry, Sally. So. <laughs> so, I've been experimenting with some AV stuff, and the other week um, I was trying to put together a uh, computer that would play in our new Welcome Center. So if anybody hasn't been to the CMM lately, Center for Mission and Ministry here in Waukesha, you're in for a treat once you do come in because we have a brand new Welcome Center and part of that is a big video screen with a welcome video and um, just some other cool stuff. So I was uh, putting together the ability to play a video there and I mentioned last week in my pick of the week um, the uh, Intel compute stick, just a little computer you plug into an HDMI uh, computer. But I was also exploring other options and one of them was a Chrome box. Uh, So this is not my pick this week, but I'm actually using the Chrome box right now to join this Hangout. One would think that uh, Google's own Chrome hardware would work with Hangouts and so far so good. And uh, I probably will kind of do a a review of this over the coming weeks. I'm going to try and uh, kick the tires on this, see how well it works. It's a pretty inexpensive solution, and so far, I really like it. And so far, so good on the Hangout, too. Yep, live testing right here, folks. So That's right. Um, we, we are not afraid. And I assume you're just plugging in your regular webcam to it? or Yep. Okay. It, uh, and that, that was kind of the question I had. What won't work? you know, on a Chrome box that will work on a full-blown computer, but it plugged in fine. I plugged in the, uh, the USB microphone that I normally use, and it's just a quick setting change to pick whatever input, output you want, and pulled everything up. So far, so good. Awesome. So we'll see how it goes. It's just a little box, and maybe I'll talk more about it in an upcoming show, but uh, we'll see kind of excited about it. I had never, I've used Chromebooks before. Early on, I haven't used any of the latest models. Um, So I'm not, I have not been kept, I haven't been keeping myself up to date on where the Chrome OS is doing. If you're not familiar with Chromebooks and Chrome boxes, basically they're just uh, lightweight computers that run a kind of a modified operating system that's just based essentially on Chrome. So you're dealing with a Without a true maybe file system, you're dealing with uh, you know a browser and anything that can run in a browser. So, but uh, good stuff. So far, so good. I can imagine you'll come up with lots of uses for churches and schools as you yep. do this evaluation and at an affordable price. So we'll look forward to that. Okay, but uh, we are talking about uh, what everybody else is talking about. All of, our, all of our listeners and viewers over the past month have been providing us feedback through different forms, and this is our community feedback show. We do this once a month, kind of collect up all the things that aren't super time sensitive that can come into the show at any given time, and then go through them, talk about them a little bit, and most importantly, share them with everybody else. Right. So um, we're going to kick off this section of the show by talking about the emails we've received. So oftentimes people use the email address wellstech at wells.net to ask all kinds of general questions about uh, technology and their ministry setting. And that was certainly the case with um, John. 
who is working uh, to develop a Bible information class. I think it's John Rudot that wrote to us. And um, he was wondering if there are people out there in Wells who have done any type of online Bible information class and uh, would love to um, see what you've done, how you've approached it, what techniques you've used and things like that as they're working to develop one as well. Yep, we've talked about this a little bit in previous shows. Uh, we've had some, uh, I think, some examples, and this is not a uh, a question that we hear, you know, once every few years. We hear this fairly regularly. I think a lot of people are trying to figure out how to meet those needs of people in, you know, more remote places or with busy schedules, not able to to make a, you know, a 7 o'clock every Wednesday night kind of schedule or whatever it is. And uh, the technology, especially for this kind of thing, is, is certainly there. Definitely. So, um, and something I think you could you could have a broader scope than just your immediate needs and your immediate congregation or your um, contacts with, with outreach prospects or whatever it may be. It could be used all over the world um, since the internet kind of reaches everywhere. So um, I could see a, a definite use case for it. One of the things that uh, probably is a hidden benefit of something like this, especially if you can do like a hangouts on air approach where you're actually recording the session is for makeups. So if people aren't able to make it, uh, they can tune into the rebroadcast at their leisure in an on-demand fashion and, and kind of get caught up. I know some congregations who actually do record their Bible information class for that purpose. Um, and I think that's just a big, a big benefit of maybe doing it like we're doing our podcast where you just hit the record button, you have it there, and then people can review it if they weren't able to make it the first time. All right. Next up in the email bag was an email from um, Matthew Gann, who's at Christ the King in Silverdale, Washington. So woohoo for the Pacific Northwest. That's a long way away. Mm -hmm. um, we are happy to hear from you, Matthew. And he's working on uh, church Wi-Fi um, acceptable use policy. So this is interesting, um, maybe a flavor we hadn't specifically talked about in the past, but as uh, Wi-Fi becomes more readily available, many people who visit your congregation and school for, for events, for worship services and things like that, would like to have the ability to jump on Wi-Fi. And if you're going to make Wi-Fi available, then you probably need some policies around that. Obviously, you don't want them coming onto your network and watching, streaming hours and hours of video or um, going to inappropriate websites or whatever it may be. And so having some policies and then obviously <laughs> the ability to enforce those policies um, is a good idea and something that should be considered. Um, we had a few things that we could point them to. I'll just share my screen quickly. Um, on the Wells Tech Wiki, we actually have um, a code of conduct from a church um, and school that was shared where they talk about acceptable uses of the internet and things that are unacceptable. And so that might work into something um, more global Wi-Fi kind of policy. I also found something similar on the MLC website, and I'll have a link to that in the show notes. And if you Google acceptable use for Wi-Fi, you'll find a lot of colleges have this covered because obviously all those students coming on campus are, are you know, expecting to have access to the internet and may or may not be making the wisest decisions on how they use that. So I think the MLC policy is a, another good place to start for this kind of thing. Yeah, I'm glad you found that. That makes a lot of sense. And MLC, now that you mentioned MLC, one of the things they also do is provide guest access, and that's all part of this as well. So if somebody jumps on your maybe open Wi-Fi, that's another place where you want an acceptable use policy prominently uh, presented to the person mm -hmm. on your network and one of the ways to do that is the same as MLC does where they have a Wi-Fi system where you have to enter, enter uh, a username so they know who you are but also have to accept an acceptable use policy that is presented right when you jump on the network so this is what we allow what we don't allow any violators you know all the 
you know, all the, the legal ease that, that's there. I think an encouragement would be make sure that it's clean and simple to read as much as possible, especially in that kind of uh, situation where somebody's just kind of clicking through to get access. But you want to at least take a stab at trying to say here are the important points, maybe in bullet points at the top, so that uh, even if they don't read all 20 paragraphs or whatever you have in your policy, they've got the, the big idea about uh, what's, uh, what's acceptable and what's not. Yep. And uh, continuing on then with email, and in the same vein, actually, we heard from uh, Nathan Deering, who's at Trinity in Marionette, Wisconsin. And Nathan indicated, I believe he's a first-year teacher there and has the title of Director of Technology. So congratulations on that, Nathan. And, Not and an unusual good sitting. Good luck. <laughs> <laughs> right. We like those young people that know all about technology. Right. There you go. Um, and so he was actually um, considering, I think, Chromebooks and implementing some new technology in the school there. Um, and his Board of Ed is looking for some type of a technology plan that, you know, indicates different um, actionable things he's going to do as he develops the technology infrastructure there in his school. And it reminded me of a, a blog post I did a while back for a class. One thing I linked to there um, was a really useful document called a rubric for comprehensive technology plan. And so again, we'll include this, this link in the show notes, but it walks through and actually assigns points to different components of a technology plan. The introduction, background information, um, program goals and initiatives, uh, current status and needs assessment, the technology design, action implementation, monitoring and evaluation, adult literacy, and format. So um, kind of gives you a checklist to go by and ideas of what to include in a technology plan and, and what their different weights might be as you're um, considering what to include there. So I think that's a useful document as you begin to develop technology planning. Uh, we did a show once, I think, with uh, Gail about technology planning and how um, how challenging it is in this day and age, but um, I think a good exercise to go through, um, especially on the front end of things like um, Nathan is uh, brand new in the position and bringing technology into the school for the first time, it seems. so. Yeah, certainly there are some nuances to you know building a technology plan, but what I liked about that document is it takes kind of the known, uh, you know, the yeses and nos, the step by steps, the things that are pretty much standards in a technology plan and, and lays them out real neatly. So you at least have a starting point, a baseline that you can get pretty far along in the thinking process and make sure you're kind of covering all the bases because if you're just sitting down in front of a blank piece of paper trying to figure out, well, how do I build a technology plan, you're, you're surely not going to go down all the you know all the channels that you need to to move forward through so those templates like that are super helpful definitely all right the next one's a little bit lighter it came from our friend Rachel Arnold who happens to be married to Pastor Phil Arnold uh, currently serving at Bethlehem in Menominee Falls in Germantown Wisconsin and she sent this picture of Phil having his first um, Facebook live event there um, for Bethlehem and she wanted us to see the high tech that was involved so I'm not sure how well uh, those that are watching can see but he's actually got um, maybe an iPhone or Android phone whatever it may be taped to some type of a I think it's a bookend it is a, a metal <laughs> bookend yep. yeah it looks like a little bit of duct tape or something Stacked similar on two, top of two Bibles yep. <laughs> and it's his camera as he's broadcasting, I think, a Bible study or whatever it may be. So a very fun uh, techie use. I think MacGyver would be proud and oh, yeah. um, <laughs> keep up the good work, Pastor Arnold, and, and uh, keep those good, uh, the good news being shared over Facebook Live or wherever it may be. Whatever works. Definitely. Whatever works. Uh, I had a couple items uh, via email. Don Vossler, who is a member of our technology committee of the Hymnal Project, uh, emailed me uh, asking about the Google Terms of Service for Google Apps, which we've talked about a couple times previously on the show. I shared with them kind of the same things that we talked about. There was some concern by their congregation that they couldn't join the Google Apps uh, bandwagon 
uh, because of the terms of service regarding discrimination. Uh, Wells Tech longtime listeners will remember these conversations. And, uh, and again, I didn't come down on one side or the other because it, it, it can be complicated and it's really up to what kind of policies and rules you have in place in your organization. Uh, but one of the things that we did talk about in, in an ability to say, yeah, I can abide by this, is essentially the congregation and who they hire and uh, you know their hiring practices are really based on no different kind of criteria than membership. So uh, you require X, Y, and Z for membership. You know, belief in in uh, every word of the Bible. Um, the confessions, those kinds of things, and obviously there are some things there that um, society wouldn't agree with, but uh, our Christian liberty and the ability to uh, have religious freedom uh, is a blessing to us in that respect and I think does apply to how we hire and how we work with uh, the outside world. So uh, I don't have necessarily a problem with Google Terms of Services or abiding by them because I think we are in compliance, but every congregation or school is going to have to look at that themselves. And it's probably worth a good look and at least a conversation um, at your organization level. If you are a Google Apps user uh, and others, uh, not just Google, have some terms of service like this. So thanks, Don, for bringing that question up and uh, allowing us to kind of revisit it here on the podcast. Yeah. I uh, got another email slash uh, snail mail uh, letter, and the reason for that is Pastor Peter Kesting from Fremont, I believe it's Fremont, Wisconsin, said he had a little gift for me, and he couldn't send it digitally, so he sent me uh, a letter with uh, uh, something in a package. And let me just quickly read the letter for you. Uh, first of all, let me show you what it is. It is a 3D printed logo of uh, the Synod's logo. Um, so this is right up your alley, Sally. Uh, it comes oh, yeah. apart. So it's, I wouldn't call it a puzzle, but uh, it's, it comes apart into three pieces. And so there's a, the cross, and he's tried to mimic, and you probably have limited colors, you know, with whatever uh, extrusion material you're going to use. But uh, so you've got the blue cross, the red background over white. So it's three pieces. It all goes together. Very cool. Um, this is what he wrote. I designed this myself using free CAD software called Tinkercad. Tinkercad and a 3D printer allows you to turn something that is floating around in your mind into something physical that you can touch within a few hours. That's the amazing thing with 3D printing, which I enjoy as a hobby. The design took me about three to four hours to make, making sure that the spaces were not too big or too small so that the pieces would fit together yet not be too loose. The three pieces cost about a dollar fifty total to print in cost of plastic. That doesn't include the cost of the printer, of course. So you kind of have to amortize the cost of the printer over that too. But it can be taken apart and put back together so you can play with it as well as display it. I plan on displaying mine in my office. So apparently this is not an original. There's more than one. Um, and Sally's got the Tinkercad uh, website up. Um, it can be taken apart, but I plan on displaying mine in the office, giving away a few as gifts. I hope you enjoy your copy. I have to admit that 3D printing isn't something that I've used a lot in my ministry. I printed a few gears to fix the church's copier. That's pretty cool. Saving over $200 in the cost of parts and a service call. I created a bracket to fix the wine dispenser for communion. My member who saw it and doesn't know that I have a 3D printer looked at the custom-made brackets made out of plastic and was flabbergasted at how I found brackets at this exact size and shape. He asked me if I whittled them out of plastic. <laughs> I've also printed gifts for confirmands. So there you have it. I hope you find it neat. I will probably get around to posting it in the Thingiverse pretty soon as others can make their own. So pretty cool, huh? Pretty awesome. I'm holding uh, my, uh, oh shucks, I think I dropped it. <laughs> Reach for it sooner. My Wells Tech logo printed right. in 3D. So that was a, a Christmas ornament last year. Pastor Kessing, I am very interested in your design and hope you get it in Thingiverse very soon. Thanks uh, for sharing that, Martin. Super cool. 
It is. Uh, I'm trying to get it back together now. Um, <laughs> you needed a little challenge <laughs> three today. Three pieces should not be as hard as that. But uh, <laughs> yeah, very, very cool. Um, so a question for you, Sally, since you're the 3D printing queen, on this show at least, can you drill a hole in this? Um, I think Kevin has drilled through some. What okay. he did was, um, you know, attach to the uh, design a little hook kind of thing. But I think we have drilled some I believe you can and it's kind of um it kind of swirls and stuff you know not, it's a plastic it's not totally solid right right, right. cavities um, in there right mm -hmm. so, so. I found it interesting that he's actually saved the congregation some money you know printing Definitely. parts gears for your copier and such uh, I think I remember you guys talking about uh, printing a part to fix your car door handle or something. that's right that's right we just uh, it wouldn't open from the outside so a little extra piece after you took the whole handle apart was all it needed and yeah we I'm sure save money doing that we printed dishwasher parts we we've done a lot of different things and um, and I have a, a cute 13 joint articulated monkey. That's the latest thing. You know, I love monkeys. Big monkey grins. Pink monkey is my favorite sight. You get a so. barrel full of monkeys and go with Yeah. <laughs> so, thank fun you, Peter. Stuff. Appreciate, first of all, appreciate the gift, the time it took, and the thoughtfulness and uh, ministry application for sure. So, yeah, good stuff. What's next, Sally? Should we do it on the Facebook? Sure. Um, just a little bit of browsing in uh, the Wells Intersections. Uh, Facebook group uh, turned up a few interesting links uh, mainly related to to using social media and your website for different marketing so um, this article how often should you post to social media uh, gives you some ideas of when people are looking at social media the most and what times of day what days of the week your posts are going to get the most coverage so that's helpful if you're if you're using something like Hootsuite where you can actually schedule your post. Um, why not schedule them to hit um, people's feeds at the time that they're they're logging in and looking at things? So Facebook every day from one to four p.m. Instagram weekends all day because people are out and about taking pictures of things and on Instagram on the weekends. Pinterest is Tuesday through Thursday. 12 p.m. and 5 to 6 p.m. So, so lunch and dinner, it sounds yeah, like, or around yeah. there. That's interesting. Yeah, very interesting. So they've got LinkedIn and Snapchat listed as well. So good article. Uh, next up is one titled 12 Questions to Improve the Usability of Your Website. And I found this one um, super interesting. I actually tagged it for a class that I teach periodically for MLC because if I'm helping someone understand how to do their website well, I want to start with um, what are people looking for? How are they wanting to use your website? What are some of the challenges that they might encounter? And this is a really good uh, common sense kind of checklist. Uh, what's the number one page that people go to and how often? How are they getting there? Uh, what do they want when they visit that page? Uh, does my design facilitate action, guiding people to, to the content they care about? Is it legible? When someone visits my site, what will bring them back again? What does my site look like when someone shares it on Facebook, Twitter, or LinkedIn? Again, just some common sense kind of things, just something we all could probably stop right now and apply these questions to our current websites and find some areas that need to be improved. And so uh, I, I love these kind of things and I love that it's that's up to date. It's from the end of June of this year. So bringing in those social media kind of questions that used to not be on these um, questionnaires just a few years ago. So right. check that out. And then one more, and this one has a 12 in it as well, 12 creative ways to use Facebook cover images for business. So Facebook gives you that large image at the top of your um, pages. Many churches and schools have Facebook pages now. Why not use that? It doesn't have to stay the same all the time. It can invite people to events. It can um, just give yourself it says more personality. It can appeal to the senses. Maybe you're having a your annual um, pig roast or hog roast or whatever it may be, and you want to um, just 
let people know that that's happening and they have a lot of good looking food in these examples on this page. Inspire creativity, promote a hashtag. So if you've got something happening and you want people to use a certain hashtag, you could do that. Um, feature your fans or feature your members. So you could um, share uh, images, including your members. And I mentioned PicMonkey just a few minutes ago. PicMonkey's collage maker actually has Facebook sized imagery built right in. So you can easily do some, um, some mashing up of different photos and things right there on the PicMonkey.com site. So good ideas for using that, that space that you have at the top of your Facebook pages. Great. That reminds me of one of the encouragements that we would normally give to people maintaining websites and social networks is kind of carve out time, maybe quarterly, maybe twice a year, that you actually do an analysis of, of you take stock of how is it going. Use the analytics software that's available. Uh, Google Analytics is, is often used and can be connected to Final Web. You can look at the insights function of Facebook. How many people are visiting? What kinds of people? Where they're from? What they're searching on? Those kinds of things. And then that's probably a good time to reevaluate. You know some of these things as well. Where, well what we're doing isn't isn't working or there are other things that, that might be even more valuable where we plug in a little bit of time and energy to uh, amp things up a little bit so uh, but if you don't kind of set that review process where you're analyzing and making some decisions these things just kind of uh, go by the wayside and you just kind of you're stuck with what you've got and then wind up wondering why nobody's visiting or engaging <laughs> or whatever so right right Good, good stuff from Wells Intersection. So uh, if you're not familiar with that, uh, Pastor James Aderman was behind that, and that came out of last, is it last summer? Yeah, last it is. summer's Wells Tech Conference, uh, and uh, kind of our theme there was intersections, and he took that and ran with it and created a great Facebook page where very uh, uh, large amount of content running through there on a pretty regular basis. So. Mm -hmm. Another great community effort is the Wells Google Schools Google Plus group, and uh, you can join that as well. I think that was started by Jason Schmidt and maybe um, Dave Tess as kind of an offshoot of classes they were teaching related to Google Apps for Education. And so uh, a hearty community, I think there's 300 plus people there that are doing Chromebooks in the classroom and other things uh, using Google Apps. And uh, a post that I picked up on it was a link to a recent announcement from Google. Since it's back to school time, there have been some changes with Google Apps for Education, um, actually now called uh, Google for Education and the G Suite. Um, but one change I hadn't known about was that they have a new feature where parents and guardians can stay in touch with things going on in your Google Classroom site. And so they can get regular email summaries of the student's work sent to them automatically. And there's instructions online um, from the teacher's perspective and also for, from the guardian's perspective about how to do a weekly summary. And it'll say things that were missing in the student's work, things that are due in the upcoming week, um, uh, different classes broken out separately, and uh, looks to be a really great summary. I know, um, at a high school level, we use a, a grading software um, at MVL, uh, the school that my students, my sons attend, and it'll tell me if they're missing assignments, but it's not nearly as in depth as this with all the, the work you're putting into your classroom site and describing the assignments and things like that. All of that can get delivered to parents if they sign up for these guardian email summaries. I think it's something you have to allow or turn on in your classroom. And so, um, and then obviously there'd probably be a, a learning curve for the parents, helping them get signed up and things like that. But uh, the people on Wells Google School that responded and discussed this topic indicated that it had been very well received by the parents. People were really happy with this new option available through Google Apps. Very nice. And one more community kind of mention, and this is coming up tomorrow night, um, probably the day the podcast is released, actually, October 19th. So Wednesday, October 19th, uh, there will be a Wells Ed Twitter chat. Uh, I believe Rachel Pearson is behind organizing this. And so at 8 p.m. Central Time on the 19th, if you head over to Twitter and you use the hashtag Wells Ed, 
W-E-L-S-E-D. Um, you're going to be part of a conversation. So you'll want to search on that hashtag and follow it and participate in a conversation. The topic is Connected Educator Month. So apparently that's what October is and uh, what better place to connect with educators than Twitter and to have conversations around education technology. So thanks, Rachel, for organizing that and promoting it and uh, blessings on that effort. Yeah, I, I don't know if I can make that one since I believe that's at the same time as our interactive faith Bible study online stuff, which will talk about it in a minute, but uh, I can always tell when I missed one because the people that I follow have 20 or 30 odd tweets that I'm reading through, so I get to review the chat through uh, at least uh, from a couple dimensions, and they talk about some great stuff on these chats where they're bringing up tools that they use and different uh, websites that are really valuable in uh, in their in their educational endeavors, so worth well worth it, time well spent. Awesome. Um, a couple of links that were shared via Digo, which is a bookmarking tool. And if you aren't part of it, you can certainly join and share links that way with us. Um, Pastor Emil Burgess shared a link to onlineocr.net, uh, which is a website where you can copy and paste text in and it will um, convert for instance, scan PDFs to Word documents so that um, you can upload a file easily and get it in actually an editable format. So online OCR, it'll recognize all that text locked away in PDFs. And sounds like he had good results with it. Um, from Gail Potratz, she linked us up with an Instagram for computer Chrome extension. So Instagram exists solely um, on the smartphone or, or tablet uh, environment. It's not something you can add images typically to from your computer. But with this extension, if you upload perfectly square images, it will allow you to add them to your Instagram account. So if that's something you were looking for, perhaps in a classroom setting where you have students contributing to a school Instagram account or whatever it may be, uh, this Chrome extension should do it for you. And we thank Gail for pointing us to that. And then just a couple from me, quick mentions. I noticed uh, Google was promoting uh, Cybersecurity Month in the month of October. We recently did a, a podcast all about privacy, but if you want to use the link um, to security.google.com, they'll walk you through a quick security checkup um, using your Google credentials and things. You'll, you'll check to make sure everything's uh, nice and secure. And then uh, a link to an article from TechCrunch where they announced Microsoft Education Edition will be arriving November 1st. So uh, this is something Microsoft's promised for a while. Um, it'll be available for purchase from November 1st, $5 per user per year. And you can either buy directly on your own or via their Enrollment for Education Solutions volume licensing agreement. So. Um, they've been trying it out since June, and it's finally ready to go live. So I'm guessing our friend Jason Schmidt might have some feedback on that in a couple. I minutes. bet he does. Have you got? <laughs> uh, do you have any experience with this, Sally? I don't yet, but uh, as of November 1st, when it's live, definitely Try be out. checking out. Yeah, I was mm -hmm. wondering what the difference is between the education version and then the the, uh, the commercial right. version. I did read, um, and I don't have a link yet, but apparently Microsoft collaborated with our friends at Breakout EDU. You'll remember Breakout is, yep. is the effort where you can bring um, kind of live games into your classroom with locks and things where students have to solve puzzles. And apparently they, they developed a Breakout around Microsoft. Um, Ah, too many M's around Minecraft because of this November 1st rollout. So a good way to introduce your students to it might be to check out the breakout available for Minecraft EDU. It's neat to watch some of these things come together. Where, mm -hmm. you know, it makes sense. And that's maybe part of the educators uh, challenge these days is trying to find the right pieces to put together because you can't just rely on one piece or another independently. Then, And there's real power in picking the right products and, and uh, helping the students get kind of a holistic view of uh, different topics based on different tools. Definitely. 
Well, I think that's going to do it for this month's community feedback. And if you are interested in providing your own community feedback, we wish you would. Uh, just go to our show notes page, wellstech.wells.net, or send us an email, wellstech at wells.net. Either way, we'll get it. There are lots of ways to, to find us. We're on all the social networks. You can leave us a voicemail. Um, uh, so take advantage of those, and uh, we will bring your topic up or your information up or your question up on the show. We will uh, do this again a month from now. If it is something real timely, so if you're recommending a conference or some online resource that has a limited shelf life or a special or whatever, we will bring those up uh, in between uh, our dedicated community feedback shows. Uh, but by and large, we try and collect it and have just kind of a big party of community <laughs> feedback like we're doing today. Right. Learn lots of new things. Sally, some sad news in our news and tech segment. Yeah, and this happens in technology startups that don't quite get off the ground. Uh, today we are reporting that the Table Project, which is uh, basically a kind of a Facebook for churches, an ability for churches to, to connect their community. The Table Project is no more. Um, as of December 31st, 2016, they'll be shutting down the Table Project. So they sent an email to all their users and actually listed a few other um, similar type projects that are out there that uh, folks might want to uh, investigate. I have one up here on my screen. It's called Unify. I hadn't heard of Unify before or I don't remember, but interestingly, it's it's similar to the other links they provided. It looks like most all of these um, types of projects are going mobile, so they don't even show a desktop um, in any of their screenshots or anything. It's all mobile, user profiles, RSVP for events, maps integration, prayer walls, message boards, staff directories, document libraries, events, etc. So um, everything mobile and, and several others, which I'll include the links to several of them, uh, the city, subsplash, Blue Bridge, um, all of those in the same kind of genre. And it seemed like almost all of them that I looked at were very mobile centric. So yeah, that one certainly is the one you just yeah, showed. Yeah. Um, one of the things about Table Project that I really liked and I hope is in some of these other products is the ability to hook up volunteers with, with needs. I thought that was kind of a niche that table, the Table Project did a nice job of is where you could submit the fact that you are available to work and those that need things done, let's say shut-ins needed a lawn mode or errands run or whatever, um, they could make those matches. And um, that's kind of an important part of you know online community or community in general is looking at people who have needs with people who have the desire and the heart to fulfill needs. So bye-bye table project. We even had our own little Wells Tech uh, mm -hmm. corner of table project world and didn't use it much and I think that's one of the challenges of some tools like this where people are all in on Facebook and you know they, they visit there but now when you throw in kind of a, a third party um, so to speak uh, social network the challenge is to get people to go there uh, versus where they always are on Facebook or Twitter or whatever so that's always yeah. the challenge. Yeah. Wells Now, I uh, want to remind everybody that uh, that is uh, there is an ongoing um, conference, a virtual conference called Gospel Outreach with Media, put on by the Christ in Media Institute and really kind of headed up by Tom Custer, uh, who we've had on the show numerous times, and he's done this before, where he puts out a number of presentations in digital format, and they kind of take different formats. The one that I have out there is from uh, a Sway uh, presentation that I did. Sway is a Microsoft technology that allows you to kind of put together a you know, a cool approach to uh, presentation technology. And then I recorded little videos that are embedded throughout the presentation. And then really the, where the conference happens is in the comment section. So uh, I know a couple of uh, area Lutheran high schools that have taken this on. And I'm sure as part of a class or some encouragement from somebody is the students will go through, pick a presentation, and then 
uh, make a comment and uh, that is uh, happening as we speak and will go on for another week and a half and then the conference will close. So some great conversations going on around gospel outreach as it relates to using media. The one that I did is, in call, is entitled Digital Christianship. It's uh, all about how Christians need to carry that faith with them online in those digital interactions and relationships, which they sometimes don't, uh, as you can see from the many uh, examples that I talk about in the presentation itself. So it's been fun so far, Sally. Yeah. I know you've done this presentation um, a few times at different conferences and things. So this is an opportunity for our listeners who can't see Martin in person to actually um, be part of that same presentation last about an hour. If you watch all the videos and, and yep. read through and look at the worksheets and things that Martin's included there. So consider it your professional development time and, and, and look at the other look. presentations there. It's built mm -hmm. kind of for high school and college students, but it, it's really not that specific in its target audience. You could benefit from many of the presentations there. Definitely. Let's move on to our picks of the week. All right. That means I need to share my screen one more time. Uh, my pick of the week came kind of from listener feedback. Uh, it actually came from a friend of mine, Lynette Charlman. We've actually had Lynette on the show before, and she was looking for uh, church year A digital research. Uh, sorry, digital resources. And uh, that's pretty popular right now as the church year calendar turns over at the end of November and we begin a brand new church year. And so I wanted to remind our listeners, we've talked about it many times on the show, that we actually have um, the lectionary available in Google Calendar format. So we have a Wells Tech Wiki page about it. And when you actually go to the calendar, you can click on any particular uh, worship day and get more details and find uh, the lectionary information, including um, the, the day of the church year, uh, the lessons and psalm supplemental lessons, prayer of the day, verse of the day, and hymn of the day and church year color. So all of that is stored in each of these individual um, events on the Google Calendar. And if you happen to be on the Google Calendar, and this works anywhere you encounter a Google Calendar, there's a link in the lower right corner that says Google Calendar. And when you click that, it'll allow you to add that calendar to your own personal Google Calendar. So if it would be helpful to you to have these events integrated with your own Google Calendar, so you don't have to come back each time and find the lectionary calendar by itself, um, just click the button and it'll be integrated right away. Um, but I also wanted to point out uh, that our worship office is hard at work on all types of planning resources, including um, downloadable complete documents. So if you're looking for the entire Church Year A, you can click a button here from uh, the worship office site and download the entire Church Year um, in one particular one PDF document and have all the information in one place. So just depends on how you want it. Maybe you want it both ways. Um, one more thing that I found linked to from that worship site is a really nice calendar of the church year uh, with all the different colors and things. And it has um, all the days, the actual uh, calendar dates for the 2016-17 uh, church year, the readings, um, the psalm, and the um, church year colors as well and seasons. So a really good reference document actually put together by Northwestern Publishing House each year. So all of those church year resources uh, make up my pick of the week and they'll be uh, included in the show notes. Nice. One thing, and you mentioned the word integrated with your calendar. That's a nice thing about Google Calendar. I probably have 12 or 13 different calendars at my disposal, but I don't have to see them all, so they're not cluttering up my personal calendar. I can turn them on and off as kind of an overlay, mm -hmm. so if you want to see any conflicts, you could, or if you just want to see a couple calendars together or a calendar all by itself, you just click the boxes. Um, and that's super helpful in trying to keep things all straight and just viewing the content that you want at the appropriate time. So that that calendar button you were talking about is a, it's a pretty powerful one to be able to sub, quote unquote subscribe you know, mm -hmm. to a calendar. It doesn't necessarily mean you're going to fill your own calendar with that stuff if you don't want to see it. So 
Yeah, you can subscribe to things like, uh, say, the 49ers uh, football schedule. Very good. Schedule. Learned after. <laughs> I'm just I'm just having this um, moment that I, I can see your calendar in my mind. <laughs> Even though they're terrible this year, um, I at least know when they're going to be terrible, and I can watch there it. You go. All right, my pick of the week, and uh, this is my first screen sharing endeavor or experiment with the uh, Chrome box here. So let me share. Oh, it does share Chrome? It looks like. Um, and uh, my pick of the week is an operating system called Ubuntu, U-B-U-N-T-U. -U. It's an open source uh, operating system built off of the Linux kernel. Um, and uh, the reason that it is my pick is last week my pick was the Intel Compute Stick. And I mentioned it at the top of the show that I plugged this into the back of the Welcome Center uh, TV to allow the presentation of a welcome video. Um, I had some challenges using that because it came loaded with uh, uh, Windows um, version 10 and uh, it was having trouble and it's having actually a lot of trouble updating to the latest anniversary release. Uh, it just would not work. So I finally gave up and said, well, what other options do I have? And lo and behold, there's all kinds of articles, and we'll include these in the show notes, about how to put Ubuntu on that compute stick. They actually sell that compute stick with it already pre-installed, but it's got uh, lower memory, so it's like it got 8 gigs of internal storage and, and uh, 1 gig of RAM, so it's pretty low-powered, so a lot of the Wisdom on the internet suggests, well, buy the Windows version, which is what I had, and don't use Windows, install Ubuntu. So there's an article there that walks you through that. It took me all of maybe an hour to get it up and running. Uh, it's really lightweight. Um, it is fast, and I mentioned it's free, and it's very reliable. Uh, and you can run uh, videos on there, looping videos. You can run screensavers, which is what we're doing primarily with that. So I think there's an application here for schools who run these kinds of monitors or other applications in the AV world uh, that you can uh, get these low-cost uh, compute sticks or smaller uh, kind of solid-state devices and put a free operating system on there and really have a, a lot of opportunities to put... Uh, uh, a lot of cool stuff up on that screen without a lot of effort. You can uh, manage the uh, operating system through um, like TeamViewer or something like that. Um, the one gotcha is it obviously requires you to know a little bit about operating uh, Linux. Uh, Ubuntu is based on Linux and um, so you have to kind of be a little more comfortable with the command line but if you do a little searching on the internet it's it's not that onerous. You just simply need to uh, kind of follow some step-by-step -step instructions. Uh, the operating system itself you know, presents you with a nice looking desktop so you can search for files, uh, install applications, those kinds of things. So it's not as hard as it used to be. Uh, but again, if you're looking into um, doing some AV stuff or uh, monitors that run content uh, in your church or school, this might be a good solution for you, very easy to install. And uh, probably the best uh, of it all is very low, re doesn't require a lot of resources. So you can put it on some very skimpy devices and still have it run without, uh, without issue. So that is my pick of the week. A little bit geeky. Ubuntu, U-B-U-N-T-U -U -U is the name of their operating system. It's probably the, the mainline uh, desktop version of, of Linux right now. So give it a shot. Awesome. Um, so does that mean you're refining your pick of the week from last week? Do you still, are you still behind the compute stick or would I you am. go yeah. a different direction? It's a great application. So if Windows 10 isn't working for you, and I think it's it's probably because it's not very full, it doesn't have kind of a full powered, you know, infrastructure there to work with. It's kind of low powered. This kind of operating system is probably better suited to it. And uh, mm -hmm. you still, I think you still can accomplish the exact same things. So Awesome. Good stuff. All right, Sally, let's move uh, forward with our ministry resource section. Let's do that. And I'm just going to ask our listeners to think back to the beginning of the show as we talked about um, 
community feedback, our friend Pastor Emil Burgess wrote to us about some OCR recognition, uh, web-based OCR recognition software that you could use to upload PDFs and convert them to Word documents. And he also included in that that he was working on an essay file or wanting to quote some from an essay file from the Wisconsin Lutheran Seminary essay files. So that made me think that we should really um, make the essay files a ministry resource and add that to our link, uh, list of links for ministry resources because there are 4,006 essays, 48 audio essays, and 14 videos online in the WLS essay file. So just a wealth of doctrinal joy <laughs> that you can <laughs> find here in the, the seminary essay. That's a word, yeah. That would yeah. Be a word applied to it. Yeah. And uh, organized in a lot of different ways. You can see things by author, by subject, by the dates, uh, going back to the 1800s even. And, really? And so... Uh, you search for my name there? I know I did an essay. I did don't know you? if it's up there or not. I did not search, but... We'll check it out. Uh, Martin Spriggs, there you are. Gospel Outreach 87 and Evangelical Stepping Stone. Look so, at that. You live in the Wisconsin Seminary Essay Files. So, there and your you name comes up in some way. others. <laughs> I'm going to so. have to read that. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, check out the, uh, the Seminary Essay Files and uh, have fun. Have some joy. Yes. There you go. What's our featured video this week, Sally? Well, it's Martin Spriggs week, apparently. So Martin Spriggs was doing digital Christian ship and he was in the sim essay files. And he's also on the together video update, which was recently released. Martin joined uh, Nicole Balza to talk about uh, the Wells mobile app and remind me, Martin. Shop Wells. Shop Wells, the Shop Wells program. I knew there was a second part to it. So, yeah. um, so yeah, we'll provide that video right there on the Wells Tech page. Um, look for that and spend a few minutes with Martin Spriggs to learn more about uh, technology in the Senate. Yeah, those uh, little updates are kind of cool. They're short, sweet, bite-sized. Nicole does a great job with interviewing folks uh, and uh, that we've covered so many topics over the last, I don't know how long they've been doing that, about a year, year and a half, something like that. Just mm -hmm. a great idea to push that out rather than just the written word. You've got uh, real uh, people talking about real things. So I had a chance to talk about the mobile app and uh, shop. Well, it was fun. So take a look at that. Good deal. Sally, we're going to do this again next week, and I have a feeling that we're going to be joined by one of our semi-regular classroom technology correspondents. The sun will shine as Jason Schmidt is back for another year of podcasting with us, Martin. And he is bringing his A-game as usual. We're going to take a look at the 2016 K-12 through uh, Horizon Report. This is a report done by the New Media Consortium. And they're looking at trends in technology and education and things that are on the horizon, things that will be making an impact over the next several years. And so we're going to dip our toe in the water with that and see what kind of interesting things we find there. Yeah, and it's interesting from year to year, the the shifts in technology, even the th over 365 days. So mm -hmm. these kinds of reports are super valuable for anybody dealing in you know, educational technology, especially since that's moving so fast. So tune in next week to talk to uh, or to listen to Jason. If you've got questions in that space, that'd be a good reason to, to give us a comment as well. Thank you, everybody, for your time this week, for uh, taking time to either watch or listen. Invite your friends, family members, coworkers, faculty members, ministry partners, whoever. Um, doesn't cost any more for us to mm -hmm. increase the viewership, and we're happy that uh, you do, and it's been a great ride, and we look forward to more conversations with you in the future. Thank you, Sally, for all your work, and um, blessings on your week, and uh, we'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye. Thank you.